cute little dog who keeps escaping the yard. Well, that's pretty frustrating, isn't it? I mean, you can't let him run loose. You might get hurt or fight with another dog. So your fence is reaching for the stars, isn't it? Well, even if you can just set up fortifications that are impenetrable to any dog, that pubster may still be struggling with anxiety or with just an innate canine need to roam. Let's talk about this stuff. And I, if you have a dog who does this, oh, look who's here. Oh, Cindy, wonderful, thank you for coming. I hope your dog doesn't try to escape the yard, but if so, give me the, some details in the comment line and we'll talk about it in particular. And if, by the way, if anybody has friends or family members with a dog who has this kind of behavior, it's potentially dangerous, but even confining the dog can really be a problem for its well-being, uh, depending on how you do it. And there's ways around this, and, and we're going to talk about that. So, in case we haven't met, by the way, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel. I'm a veterinary behaviorist. I'm residency trained in that specialty, but I've been in general practice for many years. And after this long, there's probably not much I haven't seen. So, if you have questions about anything related to dogs or cats, doesn't have to be on this subject, type it into the comment line and we can talk about it. I'm here to give some information. Um, this, by the way, is Miss America, the fa Nickel Family Border Collie, and Tony and Gaston, our cats, they're, they're here. They'll be showing up on the table because they always do. Um, so, by the way, if you can hear me loud and clear, please hit the wow button so that I know that I don't have technical difficulties and actually I did. I had to restart the darn iPhone several times before we finally got this thing underway. And it looks like I have another question. Carolyn will hand me my iPad here in a minute and I won't have to squint into the darn um, iPhone and uh, drive everybody crazy. I'll be able to see it on the iPad. For some reason it's always a few minutes behind. Oh, thank you for the hearts. Already I know I'm doing something helpful and I appreciate that very much. So. Um, I'm going to start with a story, and it's a little bit complicated, and I would like to help people learn how to actually diagnose some of their pet's behavior disorders. And what's really important among many things is people tend to, they look at a behavioral symptom and they say, well, that's the problem. Well, they might be right, but if you look at a dog or a cat who's coughing or uh, being lethargic or has a poor appetite, well, those are symptoms. That's not a diagnosis. And what's important about this is that if we, just like anything else going on anywhere in the body, if we have um, a clear understanding of why it's happening, there's a lot more that we can do uh, to get this thing under control. Um, so I'm going to turn the iPad around. There we go. And if I play my cards right, I might be able to see that question that is in the corner here. This is, um, all right. I don't know if you got to see that question, Carolyn, in the corner of this darn thing. I feel like I'm doing it by purely by accident when I find these things. Well, anyway, we'll look at it here in just a minute and see if we can figure that out. Oh, here, thank you. Carolyn is the technical manager of all things electronic around here and digital. So, these two folks, nice couple, Bill and Michelle. They have two dogs. Uh, our identified patient is Sally, and she is a 73-pound, eight-and-a-half-year-old lab. Um, all right. Now, ah, there we go. Cindy, one of my f fearful fosters tried to escape a lot when I first got him. He got better when he trusted us more. That's really valuable because there can be a lot of different reasons for dogs to try to escape the yard and that's really one of the most important things that I have to impart today and by the way Carla thank you and thank you Aphrodite Aphrodite is this beautiful English Bulldog um, Carla and her husband Tom have had for years going back to my days in general medicine and um, you know she snorts around the place and uh, is just delightful and lovable and pretty darn healthy uh, those Bulldogs can have their problems but Afro has been Pretty darn, pretty darn bulletproof so far, I think, Carla. I haven't seen her in a little while because fortunately, Afro doesn't have any behavior issues. At least not any that Carla wants to admit to. All right, so we have Bill and Michelle. 
And they have Sally, 73 pounds, eight and a half year old lab. They also have Buddy, another lab. And Buddy, well, I mean, they're both very sweet dogs, but Buddy's the one that doesn't cause any trouble. So this is really a story about Sally, okay? So when they brought Sally in for a behavior consultation, um, they, uh, here's the presenting con complaint, the problem as they came in the door. Escaping and jumping out of the yard and getting into stuff around the house. Um, it's kind of making a mess. Well, again, these are not diagnoses. These are symptoms of what's going on in this dog's brain and they need to have these things managed. Uh, escaping in the yard is unsafe um, and who knows what kind of junk this dog is gonna swallow uh, around the house. Ah, nice name. Well, thank you, Sally. Sally, Dr. Sally Foot is one of my colleagues who also does Facebook Lives, and she imparts great information as well. So, th Sally, thanks for coming. I appreciate that very much. Okay, so there was a medical history here, by the way. You know, these big dogs, <coughs> like labs, as they get older, you know, they carry more load on their joints, especially if they tend to get overweight, they've got inflammation, and, you know, at eight and a half years old, it's probably correct to assume that there is some degenerative joint changes in Sally. Um, maybe not severe yet. Well, she had been to her regular veterinarian about six or eight months previously because she had shown some difficulty jumping into the truck, something she'd done since she was a kid and now she's slowing down a little bit. So she's having a little bit of struggle jumping into the truck, but the fence, oh, no problem. Clears a you know, six, eight foot fence without touching it. So why would a dog who has some difficulty jumping into a truck bed that's, what, three feet, maybe four feet off the ground, have no trouble at all clearing a six or an eight foot fence? It comes down to motivation, doesn't it? Because when you are trying to jump that fence and you have no trouble doing it, it might be a little bit painful, but when there's a lot of adrenaline running in the system, um, we know physiologically why the pain just isn't noticeable at that moment. So what is the major driver that is causing Sally to want to escape the yard at the cost of, of pain, knowing that, well, she might be painful when she lands on the other side, but she's, she's got to get over that fence, doesn't she? Well, she's doing more things than that. These folks, Bill and Michelle with Buddy and Sally, they live in a house with a big yard. You think, well, big yard, why does she have to get out? I mean, isn't there plenty of space to run around? Well, there's more to it. So keep thinking on this thing about why this dog has to get the heck out of the yard. Bill, of course, has raised the fence already several times to try to prevent Sally from jumping. And so, of course, what does she do? Well, she reverts to digging under it and tearing at it and ripping at it. They sent me a video, and she looks pretty methodic. But if you look at her body signaling pretty carefully, you know that she's kind of frantic. I can tell you that without showing you the video, all right? So she's been digging through it, breaking through it, whatever it takes. She's pulled the pet the, the, uh, the fence apart in places to escape. So I asked Bill and Michelle, well, what does she do if you're out in the yard with her? Well, no problem at all. She just hangs out with us, okay? And in fact, sometimes when they're inside the house, this dog has tried to escape. On one occasion, Bill got home from work and he greeted his dogs. They were inside and he let them out into the yard and he was still inside. I mean, you would think they would know that. They didn't hear him jump in the car and fire up the engine and drive away. But when he was inside for about 15 or 20 minutes, he found Sally at the front of the house. She'd gotten out of the back door, the backyard and shown up at the front door. What the heck's going on? Okay, buddy never tries to escape. He has no problem, okay? So I asked, well, what's the history here? How did this thing start? Well, the first thing, time that Sally escaped the yard, um, they couldn't find her for hours. Uh, they organized a little dog hunt around the neighborhood. They had the neighbors involved. And they found Sally four blocks away, hiding under a bush, scared. Well, that doesn't sound like roaming behavior, does it? It sounds like a freaked out dog, but if she's freaked out, why is she leaving the yard? Um, on another occasion, she was found one block away. On a different day, she, they you know, left the gate open by accident. Actually, I don't think it was totally latched. It looked closed, but you know, people make mistakes. And she pushed it open and took off that way. That time, they found her on the front porch. Okay? She's been found across the street. 
she's been found in a neighbor's yard playing with children. I mean, she's a lab, most of them are great dogs with kids, right? And she jumped her fence and jumped their fence to get into the yard and play with the kids, okay? Now, she and Buddy, the other dog, they were great friends. They had no trouble at all getting along. It isn't that she's lonesome necessarily, but she has to get loose unless her people are right there in the yard with her, okay? So, uh, what's this dog like when it's off leash? Well, they had, uh, they had a family ranch in a place called Jemez, New Mexico. It's up near the mountains. We have a lot of mountains in New Mexico if you've never been here. It's, it's a beautiful place, one of the biggest reasons I'm here. Um, so they have a ranch up there and they've gone up there for the weekend and they let, you know, they have no roads, there's no traffic, there's no other dogs. So they let Sally and Buddy just run loose and, and Bill and Michelle take hikes and walk around and enjoy their ranch. So when they're, when they're doing that and Sally and Buddy are off leash, oh, those dogs are running around, sniffing and investigating and reading the bulletin boards and posting some messages. And every about every 30 minutes, Buddy shows up just to check out with his folks. Everybody doing all right here? Any behavioral cues that I need to understand? Are we going hunting or any of the things that dogs check with their leaders? It's normal canine behavior. They see their people as their leaders and they check in. Anything going on, anything I should know. Any, any orders, any way that I can earn reinforcers and resources like food and interactions. Dogs do that. Sally, on the other hand, often was near Buddy when they were running loose, but she only checked in about once an hour. You know, like one of the, about every other time Buddy came back, um, Sally would be with him. She'd never need trouble being away from them and wasn't like showing up frantically. She was just finding that situation without confinement, okay? Well, there's more. Um, so I said, well, in a broad sense, when you have her off leash, it sounds like she's a very relaxed and happy and joyful dog. Oh yeah, she's having the time of her life, they told me. But in smaller areas, in confined spaces, she showed signs of anxiety consistently. That's not that unusual. Many dogs in tight areas really struggle. And this is one of those dogs. So she's got context-specific anxiety in particular situations. This is an anxious dog, but not in every case. Well, after Bill had fortified the fence and raised it, about four months later, they got the great idea to install a dog door, something I recommend to people a lot if their dogs have separation issues, because they have a choice. You know, we forget sometimes that when we take pets into our lives and into our homes, we are requiring them to live in a human structure. Um, you know, we, are, we live in a great country, don't we? And we have a lot of choices. And, uh, you know, we can choose who we want to live with. And if things go south, we can choose not to live with whoever that is. We can move out of our house and move to another house. Um, we can go for a walk when we want to, go for a drive, we can go on vacation. Not right now, but, you know, we have a lot of choices. And when we think about that, our dogs and cats, you know, they're, they're stuck with us, aren't they? <laughs> you know? And they're stuck with the other pets. And they can't move out. Um, and in fact, if they need a change of scenery, if they're getting a little stir crazy, they cannot jump in the car and drive or even just go for a walk on their own. So we have to be aware of that. That doesn't mean we're supposed to take down our fence and pull the, the door off the hinges so our dog can do everything they want to do. But let's be aware of that and try to, try to mitigate some of the shortcomings, some of the contrivances that we foist on our dogs and our cats too, just so that we can keep them as companions because their needs matter. And if they're not getting met, we can start running into some behavior problems. So, as soon as Bill installed the dog door, Sally didn't try to uh, jump the fence anymore. Gee, what's that about? Well, she had a choice, didn't she? She could come, go inside or come, come back out. Sometimes there are outdoor noises, sometimes there are storms, and dogs can have choices. So, this isn't the end of the story. About four months later, Sally got into the trash in the recycle bin. She took things out of the pantry. She brought food into the yard. She didn't eat that food, but Buddy did. 
he gained 20 pounds. That's huge. Like a lot of lads, he couldn't get enough. So, you know, now they're a team. She's raiding the food stores and bringing it outside and, and Buddy's just polishing it off. Um, she had actually hoarded some of this stuff and made a nest in the back room of the house where, you know, Sally, uh, Bill and Michelle were saying, well, the food's disappearing out of the pantry. Where the heck's it going? Well, they knew what some of it was going. The buddy was consuming it. Well, they found later that she had a little nest where she was hoarding this stuff. Now, why in the heck is she doing that? Well, you know, it's kind of a normal behavior, but she'd never done it before. What's going on, right? Well, she was no longer escaping the yard, but now she was getting into some other odd behaviors, wasn't she? And in fact, she didn't damage most of the stuff she stole. In fact, they'd found a box of Kleenex, actually, but the box had been removed. She had meticulously torn off pieces of the cardboard box around the Kleenex, and they found the Kleenex stacked up in the yard, because she'd brought it out through the dog door, and taken the box off. She had, um, she had uh, done well inside with Buddy for on three or four separate, uh, let's see here. One day, she stole a, a box of Girl Scout cookies out of the pantry. And she had uh, buried that inside um, in the paper sleeve in a potted basil plant inside. And what they found was torn pieces of the cardboard box of the cookies, but they didn't know where the heck the cookies were. They found them later buried in the basil plant. She had dug them up several months later and never damaged the packaging. Odd behavior, right? So after many weeks of daily food stealing, Bill and Michelle blocked the dog door and two days uh, after they inadvertently left it open, th th confining her again was a, you know, the only way to control this thing. The, both dogs stole a, a big bag of clementines. You know, they look like little tangerines, and then spread them around the backyard, okay, uh, through the dog door. Well, you know, people make mistakes, and they try to solve these things on their own. They try to figure out how the heck are they going to control these dogs. And what comes to mind for so many people is, uh, you know, let's screw the lid down on this thing and prevent these dogs from doing the things that they're doing that are a problem. Yeah, but those are symptoms, aren't they? And we need to understand the problem. And well, Bill and Michelle had the great sense to bring these dogs into a specialist, me, and say, what are we gonna do about this thing? Because they realized they were just treading water on this thing and weren't getting anywhere at all. Well, there was one more thing, okay. <laughs> Turns out, and, and you know, it's important to ask these questions. I don't expect other people who don't have my training, but it turns out that could Sally have a separation anxiety problem? Well, as a matter of fact, she did. And typically, we think of dogs who do that as trying to break out of the house and damaging the door or the woodwork, trying to escape, or tearing the window blinds or the drapes off the windows because, you know, they're trying to get out the window. Um, not every dog who is destructive when home alone is damaging the house. Some of them chew furniture. Uh, some of them, you know, house soil. Uh, some of them, when people come home, they're panting and pacing and they're hypersalivating. Um, some of them, when people come home, they don't even know the dog's been distressed in their absence. Uh, it turns out that as many as 30% of pet dogs have a separation problem, and it may not be obvious. Well, this dog certainly had a separation problem. Thank you for those hearts, by the way. Some dogs with separation anxiety, the only behavior we see is they're escaping the yard. And very often those dogs aren't going very far. When Sally started doing it, she got herself so freaked out, she got kind of lost four blocks away and hid under a bush. But after that, she started just staying close, often camped out at the, at the front of the house, just sort of freaked out. But just by giving her enough choice to go inside and outside of the house, she was better. Choices are good, aren't they? I like my choices. I'm always looking for more, personally. And I like to make sure everybody else has some, too. But I said, you know, turns out that of dogs with separation behaviors, a full 30% of them are also noise phobic. And it turns out that we know from recent research on uh, the genetics of many of these behaviors that the genes that control noise phobia 
are very closely linked physically on the chromosome to the genes that are often responsible for separation behaviors. Now, we don't know yet if all of these dogs with these behavioral tendencies have a genetic root cause, but we do know that dogs who have been rehomed more than a time or two are more prone to separation behaviors. Those who have spent time in shelters are more prone to separation behaviors. And by the way, just as an aside, these fostering programs that many shelters have, where they take dogs out of the cages and runs and send them home with people to stay with these families and their other pets while they're looking for homes for them, those dogs are much less prone later to develop separation behaviors, okay? So those, those programs are valuable for so many cases. So anyway, noise phobia. Yeah, it turns out Sally had that too. She was reluctant to take leash walks during storm season, which we're just starting right now in, in New Mexico. And when Bill and Michelle were away during thunderstorms, they noticed that there were more escape attempts. So when they got home during a storm, they would find her hiding and trembling. Well, this dog's well-being is really suffering, isn't it? I mean, besides her people worried about her well-being and her safety when she was leaving the yard, this dog was a nervous wreck a lot of the time. That dog door helped, but that wasn't the whole solution. Well, we see that often, don't we? I mean, how many of us? Raise your hand if you realize that just about everything in life is too complicated for a simple solution, <laughs> right? There are simple solutions, but there are a lot of things where we don't find that quick fix, do we? And we've got to figure it out and work through it. Life is complicated, isn't it? So, this problem was too, actually these problems. So here are my list of diagnoses for Sally. She had separation anxiety. She had inadequate behavioral opportunities. Remember how I was mentioning that dogs living in a human home, many of them, like Buddy, he adapted just fine. And so many dogs and cats do. And in fact, when Sally was out stealing food, he was adapting to that opportunity, wasn't he? Um, but Sally, she was having a hard time. She was a round, square peg in a round hole. That's what I'm trying to say. She just wasn't managing to adapt because she had an anxiety disorder. Um, and she had escape with intent to roam. How do I know that? I mean, that's a, that is a recognized behavioral diagnosis in dogs, but it really isn't necessarily a behavior disorder, is it? Because when we've studied dogs in their free living social environments, you know, feral dogs, uh, dogs who just, you know, live out in the wild, uh, they have a hierarchy, they have a leadership structure, and those dogs need to leave the territory. It has a scent boundary, not a visual boundary. They all know where the edges of their territory are, and other dogs who you know, happen by, they know as well, and they know that it may not be a great idea to come barging into some other group's territory. That's a, that's a dog thing, they get it. We don't necessarily get it. And looks like, oh, Leon, thank you for coming. I'm delighted to see you. And Diane, I would love to have a citation on shelter kennel versus home info as it relates to separation anxiety. I can probably find that for you. Send me a specific message on my Facebook page, and I'll see if I can dig that up in the next few days. Um, you know, I read so much research articles, and I try to keep it cataloged. I try real hard to find that, okay? But it definitely exists. Okay, so, uh, plus we've got this darn noise phobia problem with this poor dog who just freaks out and is even more prone to need to escape. So if your dog has separation behaviors, or if your dog has noise phobia, storms, fireworks, here in Albuquerque, the balloons, the hot air balloons, very similar problem, then you should get a cheap home surveillance camera system, 99 bucks, you can get a Nest Cam, N-E-S-T, and you can, uh, with a, a mobile app for your smartphone, and uh, they, you, they send you two cameras, or you can just prop up your smartphone and take a look at what your dog is doing. And if your dog, while you're gone, is pacing, looking nervous, ears are kind of midway back or back, tail down, and you see behaviors that are different when your dog is home and content and relaxed with you, that dog has a separation problem. And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
So what did I tell these folks? Well, I didn't start any medications yet. Many of these anxieties, they're really not going to do very well unless we rebalance the neurochemistry in the brain. But instead, in this case, what I told them was that Sally, like so many labs, well, like almost all dogs, highly social individual. And was, she was struggling with her confinement in her yard, in part because she was unable to enjoy the natural behavioral opportunities that she would have if she were a free living dog. I'm not telling them, okay, you know, just let her run loose. Not going to happen. But she didn't have the behavioral opportunities that, that she needed. And the confinement was a very big problem. And so, how do we safely allow our dogs to get off territory like all dogs need to at least a couple times a day to read the bulletin boards and post some messages and encounter other dogs maybe uh, and play and forage and eat junk. Okay, they have to do that stuff. Well, that's what dog parks are for, isn't it? Um, well, there are things that can go wrong in dog parks, usually not. Parasite transmission, there was a very good study that was presented just last week at the annual Veterinary Behavior Symposium to show that dog parks have an enormous amount of parasite eggs and that many dogs who go to dog parks, about 30% of them pick up parasites. Is that a reason to take away your dog's natural freedoms? No, it's not because we have excellent monthly heartworm and intestinal parasite preventatives and we've got to look after our, our pet's well-being and not say, well, gee, just because there are risks, we're not going to do that stuff because emotional well-being, my perspective, I think it trumps a lot of other gambles. I mean, most of us drive pretty much every day, don't we? And it's the riskiest thing any of us humans do, but we do it because it's part of our, our full life. And we just try to be careful about it. Well, that's what we need to do with our dogs. And if you want to spend some money, you can take your dog to a doggy daycare service where they have people who supervise them and do these. When the dog first joins the group, it does some very controlled observations and greetings. To make sure that your dog is not going to be a problem. So there's safety that way, but you do spend money on that stuff. But dogs need those opportunities to get away from home, outside the territory, and sniff rear ends and do some competitive urinating. It's part of who they are. Um, and some dogs really have a problem if they don't get that need met. And even if your dog is well adapted at home, it still has that basic canine need. So I'm going to really lean on everybody to get their dog into off-leash environments, off-territory, unless they don't do well in those situations, and some dogs don't. Okay, Not everybody's the same. So when Buddy and Sally were home, I told Bill and Michelle I wanted those dogs to be engaged in canine-specific behaviors. Now, again, not everything works for everybody. You've probably seen me show food toys, and there's lots of them. This is the one I suggest most. This is called a twist and treat. It's got this funky shape. Take it apart. You can put dry food. I like to put canned food in it and then screw it back together, initially making it easy for the dog to manipulate it and get the food, and then stick it in a Ziploc and freeze it overnight. Take it out of the bag and give it to the dog, and they can take a long time to pick and manipulate and you know, extract the food, which is much like natural foraging behavior that dogs do in the wild. They can stay occupied, and this is physical and mental exertion. And when a dog gets pretty good at it, this particular toy, you can adjust it, make it a little bit more challenging. Lots of other food toys. Best food toy for your dogs are the ones they like the most. And you rotate them. In fact, in many cases, I suggest people stop feeding their dog from a bowl at all. Get rid of it. Right. Require your dog to work for its food. In fact, in many cases, you can build a digging box on the north side of your house, put one by 12 in the ground. One side of the box is the north side of the house itself. And the north side of the house is important because there's very little sunlight there because of the way the sun moves. And the ground, especially here in the desert, doesn't get so hard packed. And you can mix in a little bit of sand and topsoil. You can get a hoe and loosen it up, mist it with a little bit of water, and then you can bury some food toys, and your dog can dig those up and extract the food. If your dog's indoors, you can hide food toys under furniture or beneath sofa cushions. Make it challenging for the dog. And that's what they need. That's what dogs actually do when they're in the wild. 
Nobody fills their bowl for them. They're out there scrounging. Well, that's natural. It's a normal, healthy stress that they're supposed to engage in. Okay? Well, but in this house, at Bill and Michelle's house, we've got Sally and Buddy, and of course, Buddy's the little porker, and, you know, he might steal all the food toys and then put on weight and have medical issues that we don't need. Okay? Food toy, good advice for my Eva, who's super active, whoops, ah, super active, and sometimes, trying to get, there we go, doesn't let me work when I have class. Yeah, dogs, you know, people say, well, I think my dog's bored. You can use that word if you want. On the behavioral side, we say missing out on some of the essential canine species specific behavioral opportunities you know so foraging it's a good one again you, you've got to have we've got to have some flex we don't make everybody follow the same rules because you know what about buddy the for, the porker <laughs> right and these dogs are great friends and they really relied heavily on on the companionship and the and the joy of playing together like any other good lab so um, what are we going to do about those fireworks? Well, that needs a treatment of its own. Here's something that, you notice how sleepy Miss America is? Here, girlfriend. <laughs> she says, I don't have a care in the world, Dad. I'm just happy to snuggle up to you. She usually fidgets a little bit more. And here's why. I'm going to show you this. I've shown this before. This is called Cilio, S-I-L-E-O. It's a prescription medication for as needed use, given I, ideally 20 minutes before a thunderstorm, but it doesn't need to be, can be given during a thunderstorm, and they're predicted. And frankly, I've been watching the weather all day in anticipation of this Facebook Live event, and uh, well, the storm hasn't arrived yet. But a dog who has a problem with thunderstorms, like Miss America here, they can smell the moisture changing in the air, the ionic shifts, because of the electricity between clouds, they can feel that. And I like to give this to her in anticipation. This is a gel. It goes um, between the lower lip and the gum, way back there in the corner, what's called the buckle pouch, B-U-C-C-A-L. And in fact, here I'll show you, Miss America, and pick up your little face, cute girl. And you slide it right back there. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing between the lower lip and the gum. Have her head up, put a little dab back in there, you dose it according to these little dots on the, uh, on the barrel of the plunger of the syringe. You can see those right there. And uh, if your veterinarian doesn't have it, the doctor can order it. All veterinary distributors have it, and it lasts for a couple of hours. And so you can repeat it every two hours, um, five times in one day. Um, and uh, it does a very good job of reducing uh, storm phobia. It doesn't really have a sedative effect, except that well, she's a little more relaxed with it. I don't think I'd give her the car keys, but I'd go out and play and horse around in the yard with her. Don't worry about that. Okay. So we have various tri uh, tricks up our sleeve, and as much as about 30% of dogs with separation anxiety also have noise phobia, Miss America here is one of the others. She has noise phobia, no problems with separation behaviors. Okay. Probably genetic. We live with it. Okay. We accept that. Um, so, uh, I dispense cilio. Now, I saw Sally um, about a year and a half ago. And since that time, we have something really new and very cool. And it's called the Calmer Canine. And let me show you this. I'm going to turn the camera around. There it is. This is the box that it comes in. Calmer Canine. There's this pretty yellow lab there. That's the name of this thing. And I'm going to show you this in just a minute. And um, Miss America decided she's, you don't want to come. Well, you can sit with me. Well, that's a big girl. There you go. Um, oops. Here's my picture of my excellent Airedale one. There we go. So this is what the Comer Canine looks like. Um, very lightweight. The, the unit itself is right here. This, this halo here, it, well, the whole thing sits right behind the dog's head. And it looks like this when the dog is wearing it. Um, you can just hold it back there when you give your dog the twice daily treatments or 
touch that. There we go. Um, or they have this little vest, as they call it. It's a fabric thing that goes around the dog's neck and around her chest, right behind her shoulders. And it's got a little tab that connects them with Velcro. And what it's got a little Velcro patch right behind the dog's head where this little Velcro thing on the back of the device, the calmer canine, sits right back there. And um, treatments are twice daily, 15 minutes, turns itself off. You push the button and uh, the little light blinks and tells you that it's, it's working. There's no sensation associated with it. And it's a pulse electromagnetic field that targets the fear center of the brain, the amygdala, and adjust the chemistry inside what are called the microglia, the active neural cells in that part of the brain. Um, and very good research behind it, and these dogs are less anxious. And there's no medication that you need to use, although in severe cases we'll use that, the calmer canine, and the medication. And if you're interested in reading more about it, the web address is calmer. I'm, I was raised by, my folks came from New England, and they don't say L's in the middle of a word. So they don't say palm, and they don't say calm. They say palm and calm, and so I still do. Anyway, it's C-A-L-M-E-R, calmer, and then the letter K, and the number 9.com. Calmer, K9.com. Anyway, it's a very good product. Very, totally safe, no side effects. And for dogs with separation anxiety is what it's, FDA approved for, but off-label, we've used it for many dogs who have anxiety manifestations of other kinds. So going forward, we're going to be using it on Sally, the lab, um, and we anticipated making a difference with her separation anxiety and with her noise phobia, her storm phobia. One of the times she ran off, by the way, the neighbors were having their roof replaced and making all that racket. I mean, she had a problem with, with noise phobia. So I hope you learned how to put these things together. I'm, I'm trying to teach people how to sleuth out their pet's behavior disorders because you can figure a lot of this out if you understand what to look for and if you make liberal use of a video camera. Um, you know, I think to a large extent it comes down to empathy. Uh, I'm not by any means suggesting that Bill and Michelle lacked empathy when they, you know, tried this, tried that. And of course there are people who make the mistake of confining a dog with separation anxiety to a crate because the dog has done so much damage to their house. Well, when they're confined like that, and I'll tell you, dogs with separation behaviors typically have a very big problem with confinement. And they get frantic. They lose their mind. And they've fractured their teeth and cut their lips and broken their nails. I'll tell you, if your dog has separation issues, the last thing you want is more confinement. So the dog door, very helpful. Dogs need to jump the fence. I mean, it's written all over Sally's case. So what you want to do is give the dog all the choices they can. Recognize that they're members of a different species. They have different rules. Not in everything, but in some things. And so empathy is really all about walking a mile on the other creature's moccasins, right? So dogs are different. And you can't look at a dog who jumps the fence or tries to tear its way out of the house with the same lens that you would look at a human who did that stuff. Because these are canine issues. And cats, by the way, can have separation anxiety too. They don't typically damage the house. Um, they typically urine soil in their person's absence. And so, if you have a cat who urine soils, <coughs> it's the most common behavior problem in cats. And you think, all right, how can I sleuth this one out? Well, if it only occurs when you're gone, Start thinking about separation anxiety on your cat and use a video camera. And your veterinarian can help you out with that. And if you're in New Mexico, I'd be happy to help you out with that directly if you need my help. Um, so uh, empathy. Look at what's going on in the other creature. And instead of trying to simply control the symptoms, like so many people raise the fence or confine their pets, um, what's really going on? And get some help with that thing. Take the time to build a foundation of trust and choice and freedom before asking your pet to do things differently for you. You need to get their basic needs met. And very often those are, well, they're all different than human needs. You know, it's a, it's a kindness thing too, isn't it? Because, you know, we need to build a strong and excellent relationship right from the get-go. They need to know that they can trust us. 
and that they're not going to get intimidated. And sometimes when people inflict fear on their pets, don't judge people harshly. Because sometimes they do it, they think they're doing the right thing. And the result is fear. And we need to look at that pet and go, you know, I need to do the right thing for this individual who's different than I am. Just like different people are different. And it's a different species on top of it. So get some advice from a qualified professional. Um, and make sure we're doing the right thing. And you're always welcome to send me your questions. Do we have anything else here that I need to uh, address for people? I'm really glad that people are sending me questions and participating. I'm really, you know, this, I want to do these things interactive. So um, let's make sure we investigate every behavior and make sure we're doing everything we can to help these pets. So, uh, there's nothing else. You can send me your questions on Facebook. And I hope you found this helpful. I do these things every week, and I write a media blog every week because I'm interested in bringing out the best in pets and their people. I was doing that for years in general medicine, and having completed a veterinary behavior residency, I'm now doing it with pathology of the brain that is manifest with behavioral symptoms. And so I'd like you to get this stuff every week, even if you can't tune into my Facebook Live events. Just go to my website, drjeffnichol.com, D-R-Jeff-N-I-C-H-O-L.com, and you can subscribe. Just go to the bottom of the homepage, cost nothing, put your email address in there, and every Tuesday morning, you'll get my Facebook Live event from the week previous, and my media blog, which also shows up as a newspaper column in the Albuquerque Journal every Friday morning. And uh, you get that stuff absolutely no cost. And by the way, when you do subscribe, I will send you at no charge um, my pet first aid and CPR guide, cats and dogs. Uh, quick bullet points, if you have these problems, do this stuff now. Uh, whether it's heat stroke, uh, lacerations, hit by car, seizures, there's a whole lot of stuff in there, poisonings. You want to make sure that you have that kind of thing at your fingertips and you can print it out and stick it to the fridge so it's handy. Um, so if you have friends, you're welcome to send them uh, to my website as well. It's searchable, there's a great deal of information. So thank you for spending a little time with me and enjoying pets and for loving your pets and for caring enough about them to gather information to make everybody's life better. So thank you again, I'm Dr. Jeff Nickel along with Miss America, the Nickel family border collie and Gaston who's on the table and Tony is uh, taking a nap on the floor right now. Have a great weekend, and stay safe, and please wear your mask.